a hard hitting investigative journalism interview today with historian William J. Federer, just in time for the Christmas season. Was Santa Claus real and did he spend his whole life at the North Pole with vertically challenged helpers making toys for kids? Was Jesus really born on the 25th of December? More importantly, are Christmas trees pagan? And why do we decorate them with lights? Is Santa Claus just a useless distraction from the gospel? All these questions and much more will be answered on today's episode of Hello Talk. I'm an anti-feminist because I think it's oppressive. I think it's anti-male. I think it's anti-femininity. Now, it may be a very weak Brexit, but I'll tell you what, Brexit of any kind and leaving those treaties as well. That's the best <laughs> ever interview. <laughs> With Michael Parkinson. You got nothing on this book. <laughs> William J. Federer is a historian and best-selling author and speaker. I've read his book, There Really Is a Santa Claus, and waited until now, uh, the Christmas season, to share this interview with you. And we're doing that uh, today. He's uh, able to be found at the website, AmericanMinute.com, where he'll send out an amazing email just with uh, some short history facts that are really relevant to all of Western uh, civilization really but especially American history every single day so make sure after this interview you head to AmericanMinute.com and uh, subscribe to those emails where you can also find the archive of, of all the past ones for a bit of light reading welcome to Pello Talk William well Dave great to be with you now I'm absolutely fascinated by the the interviews I've seen you doing before and, and seen you doing some of your your speaking and um, it, it, it just it, it's amazing how you can uh, go from from nugget of historical fascination to another one, and they just don't stop coming. So I'm not sure we're going to get much achieved in in 20 to 30 minutes, but uh, hopefully um, we can extend that a little bit uh, if you've got the time and uh, just really unpack all you know about Santa Claus. Uh, so is he a real person? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for having me on, and I uh, consider it a great honor. Um, the book is uh, one that's uh, really done well. I uh, actually recorded a Dennis Prager video with it that should be coming out sometime. Wow, course, that's exciting. That's a huge honor. Forget Pillow Talk. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, there is only five minutes, so I have to really cut it down. Wow, I but, bet you do. I, okay, well, um, we can I, promote Pillow Talk that way. You, you'll get the you'll get the preview, the teaser on uh, PragerU, but if you want the full history lesson, come to Pillow Talk. There you go. There you go. <laughs> well, I have a PowerPoint presentation that uh, I'd like to share with the viewers, and uh, I'll go ahead and go to the share screen now, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, please. And uh, and so I'll be narrating uh, along with it. Um, and, uh, but the point I is interesting is that God saw fit to have the church born into a one world anti-Christian government, the Roman empire. So evidently God's not concerned about persecution because the church was born into it and had three centuries of it. Mm. Um, and so there were 10 major persecutions in the first yeah. three centuries of Christianity. Christians were thrown to the lions. They were killed by the gladiators in the Colosseum. You know, Nero would Christians in, in burlap and them in tar and, and put them on like, um, poles and then light them on fire and they were called Nero's torches you can see in this picture in the background you see you know in the foreground there's Christians tied on these poles and then in the background they're burning you know yeah. and um and when Peter was crucified upside down um so um uh all the apostles were martyred uh except John and the story is they threw him in a pot of oil to be burnt and and he didn't die um we have these persecutions Nero uh, 64 to 68 AD, and then Domitian and Trajan and Marcus Aurelius, Septimus Severus, Maximin, Maximinus, Maximinus, the Thracian, Decius, <laughs> Valerian, Diocletian, and Glarius. Um, now, uh, and there's Nero's in his palace, and then again, you see those Christians on porches to the side of the screen, they're being lit on fire. And um, so, 60 AD. Uh, you have an emperor, Galenius, and he temporarily suspends the persecution of Christians. And now there's a revival of Christians that are, you know, coming to the Lord, especially in the military. And um, 
Then uh, the Romans lost some battles with Persia, and Emperor Diocletian uh, asked his generals why they lost. And the general said, well, it's your fault. You've neglected worshiping the Roman gods. And so Diocletian says, okay, everybody in the military, you have to go back to worshiping the Roman gods. Well, there's a whole lot of Christians in the military by this time. Sorry, uh, you're kicked out or we kill you. And then once all the Christians were out of the military, Diocletian decided to use the military to force the entire Roman Empire to return to worshiping the Roman gods. And he started an empire-wide persecution of Christians. They went province by province, tearing down churches, burning their scriptures, cutting out their tongues, boiling them alive. And um, anyway, uh, you know, a lot of the, um, so we don't have a whole lot of records of the early three centuries of Christianity. It's like, yeah, that's because Diocletian would burn them, all these uh, records. And the, you know, and then some pastors would go to their death rather than giving up the scriptures. And then other ones would cave and give up the scriptures. And then, you know, it was a, a big deal in the first couple of centuries. Now, why yeah. is this important? Because this is the period of time that St. Nicholas is born. St. Right. Nicholas is the right. most He's the most popular Greek Orthodox saint. Uh, he is to the Greeks what St. Peter is to Catholics, what St. Patrick is to the Irish, um, what St. Winifred or Bonf Boniface is to the Germans. But St. Nicholas, the most popular Greek saint, and um, the Roman Empire is spread all around the Mediterranean. And he was born in an area that is today Turkey. Then it was the Byzantine Empire. But... Actually, it was at the time he was born, it was still the, the Roman Empire, and he was uh, lived in a little town called Patara, and uh, it's not too far from the coast, and um, the story is, there was a Christian movement that swept the time uh, called Pietism, ah, yes. and it was this thought that if you really, truly became a Christian, you should give away all your money and live in a cave and be a hermit or join a monastery or, you know, in Egypt, they would build platforms in the desert and bake in the sun, thinking they're denying their flesh and getting holier. But it was all this me-focused salvation, mm -hmm. uh, which is important. Sal salvation wouldn't be salvation unless it was a personal relationship with God. But it sort of withdrew so much that it um, later caused an abandonment of uh, wanting to pass on the Christian civilizations to the next generation. Yeah, sure. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so... Uh, Nicholas uh, becomes a true Christian. He decides he is going to give away all his money, but he doesn't want to get credit for it. So he sneaks into town at night and throws money in the window of poor people. And then one story that became very popular was there was a merchant in the town of Patara who had gone bankrupt. And back then the creditors would come and not only take your house and lands, they would take your children sort of like sex trafficking. Yeah. And so this merchant had three beautiful teenage daughters or maybe their early twenties, but uh, he knew if that the creditors took his daughters, they would have a horrible life of sex trafficking and prostitution. And so the dad had an idea. He thought if he could hurry up and marry the daughters off, the creditors couldn't take them, but he did not have money for a dowry, which was needed in that area of the world for a legally recognized wedding. Mm -hmm. Nicholas hears the problem late one night, throws the money in the window, and the oldest daughter has a dowry. She gets married. It's a big buzz, talk of the town. And then later he throws the money in the window for the second daughter. Uh, she gets married, buzz, talk of the town. And by the time it comes around to the third daughter, uh, by this time, dad is waving up. He runs outside, catches Nicholas. Nicholas makes the dad promise not to tell where the money came from. And uh, that was the beginning of the tradition of secret gift giving on the anniversary of Nicholas's death, which was December 6, 343 AD. Supposedly, uh, these, there, were, there were three bags of gold, gold coins, and uh, they landed either in a shoe or a stocking that was drying by the fireplace. And so you can begin to see where some of these traditions originated from. Yeah. Uh, this is a, a, was a, very popular theme uh, in um, the church throughout the Middle Ages, and a whole lot of artwork uh, portrays Nicholas throwing the money in the window of uh, this family with the three daughters. Yeah, wow. And, um, there's even a uh, stained glass window 
where it has Nicholas on one side throwing the money in, the daughter's picking up the, the three bags on the other side, and at the bottom of the stained glass window, it says he provides a dowry for three girls. Wow. And uh, and so he's always pictured in, um, you know, Middle Ages art and Renaissance art of uh, being a bishop uh, and having three gold balls represented, three bags that he, of gold coins he threw in to save these girls. Uh, now, one, so <laughs> interestingly enough, uh, that's why he became the patron saint of pawnbrokers. <laughs> so wow. pawnbrokers will hang three gold balls outside of their shop to represent the three gold balls that Nicholas had. Because they're motivated so, by philanthropy and Christian charity, of course. Yeah, yeah. It's a little bit of a stretch, but uh, the <laughs> pawnbrokers say, well, we help families out in their time of financial need. And mm -hmm. it's like, well... <laughs> I guess he can make it fit, but uh, but he is considered the patron saint of pawnbrokers. It's and, interesting uh, that uh, he's pictured so often in your pictures here in red, because um, uh, I understood that uh, he was dressed in other colors, brown and maybe multicolors, until Coca Cola got a hold of him. I'm sure you'll get that get to that um, eventually, but um, but yeah, I'm just noticing all the red that Nicholas is portrayed in already. Yeah, and it's one of those things that obviously living in, you know, dying in 343 AD, there wasn't any pictures of him and he um, didn't have any paintings of him during his lifetime. Okay. Um, so it was all, uh, you know, an artist type rendering. Yeah. Um, uh, but um, the, he, once he gave away all his money, uh, he was going to do what um, the pietist did was to go join a monastery. Mm -hmm. And so he was going to join the monastery of Zion over in the Holy Land. And he makes the pilgrimage over there, goes to the monastery. And the story that the Greeks passed down, the Greek Orthodox, uh, by the way, there's more Greek Orthodox churches named after St. Nicholas than anybody else. Hmm. And so they have lots and lots of stories about him. And um, anyway, the, the, the one account is he's, about to take his vows to join this monastery and the Lord impresses upon him not to hide his light under a bushel. Mm. And so he decides he's going to go back to Asia minor. Uh, the, uh, the Greeks, they have quite a bunch of stuff and I put it all in the book where he gets on the boat, the boat's going to instead go to Africa. And he says, no, I'm supposed to go back and a storm comes and it blows it back. And, you know, somebody falls off the mast and dies and he prays for him and he raises the guy from the dead. Yeah. They have lots of stories, but he does get back to Asia Minor. But instead of going to Patara, he goes to another city called Myra. And it is right on the coast. It is a big city. And uh, unbeknownst to him, now this is still during the Roman Empire period. And that's time. modern day Turkey for those modern playing at Turkey. home. Right. And so today that city of Myra is called Demre, okay. but it's, you know, the ruins are still there from when he lived there. Mm -hmm. So the story is that unbeknownst to him, the Bishop of Myra had died and the church leaders could not decide who the next Bishop's going to be. And one of them had an 80 year old, uh, you know, deacon had a dream that the first person to church the next day would be named Nicholas. And he was to be their Bishop. Hmm. Well, Nicholas's habit was to fast all night uh, and then go to church the next day, which, by the way, was the tradition uh, for millennium that you would fast and then uh, you would go to church. And then after having communion, that's when you would break the fast. And so it was called break fast mm -hmm. or breakfast. That's yeah. the word breakfast means break yep. fast. So Nicholas shows up at the church. The elderly guy is waiting. The first person in the door is him. And the, the elderly guy asks his name and he says, Nicholas. And so the elderly guy takes him to meet the other church leaders. And they tell him, you're supposed to be our next bishop. And he was not too excited about the idea. <laughs> because the, Ro the Roman emperor was Diocletian. Mm. And he was collecting bishops and killing them. Yeah. So it was sort of like, uh, you be the bishop. No, no, no. I insist you first. No, no, no. You be the bishop. No, <laughs> Because whoever's going to be the bishop was going to get uh, attracted. So sure enough, uh, there's the painting of him walking in the door. Uh, you know, the, the elderly guy that had the dream, um, he was, uh, according to the story, given the name Nicholas. So when he asked Nicholas's name and Nicholas said that, that was the confirmation. So they, 
they he decides to go ahead and be their next bishop. Uh, again, the, the little town of, of Myra is still there. It's in ruins. Um, but, um, it was on the coast. Um, wow. And, uh, you know, it um, all goes back to the to the Roman times. Mm. The ruins of Myra, and um, so so he's the bishop, and he is arrested, and he's put in prison, and he's awaiting death. So uh, while he's in prison, some things happen. Diocletian, this terrible Roman emperor who is killing Christians, is struck with an intestinal disease so painful that he abdicates the throne. Ah. This was unheard of because by this time, the Roman emperors had been declaring themselves a god, That's sprinkling right. gold dust in their hair, demanding that their image be worshipped by you know, taking a pin pinch of incense and burning it in front of his statue. And, and so here's like a god resigning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, here these Roman emperors are saying, I'm a god. And here it's like he's resigning. So he yeah. takes up farming on the Dalmatian coast, wow. which became you know Yugoslavia and Bosnia, Croatia, that area today and they still have a um uh part of where his palace was uh they built a cathedral which is sort of interesting that they built a church over where he uh, had died where he was trying to wipe out the church yeah but um anyway so he um abdicates the throne the next emperor to take his now so the date is may 1st 305 a.d okay this was uh considered a world shaking event that the emperor of the most powerful empire in the world is resigning. Mm. And so uh, the next emperor that takes over is Galerius, and he continues the persecution of the Christians, but he is, and he's also struck with the intestinal disease, but he dies. So he doesn't just abdicate, he dies. And so in the Roman empire, when a emperor dies without a clear vice emperor standing in line, the generals uh, size each other up and they claim to be the next emperor. And if you don't like it, fight them. And, and, and so you have to understand that the Roman soldiers pledged allegiance to their general. They didn't pledge allegiance to their country. It's to their, and they would go to their death on the order of their general. And so uh, when Galerius dies, there are four generals. And um, uh, two of them are quickly defeated. And then it comes down to Constantine and Maxentius. Okay. And um, Constantine is a general, Roman general. He is in York, England. Mm. So the Romans first invaded England under Julius Caesar. And, uh, and from that point on, they always had outposts there and they would like raid a little further north. And then there was the Emperor Hadrian that built Hadrian's Wall, which is sort of the division between, you know, England and Scotland. And, yes. um, but um, so here you have uh, Constantine, Roman general in England, Emperor Galerius dies. His army surrounds him and says, hail Caesar. In other words, we're with you. You be the next Caesar. Yep. And so Constantine marches toward Rome. And so it turns down to this battle between Constantine and Maxentius. And um, Maxentius is inside of the city of Rome and Constantine is outside. And the story is the day before his battle, he saw the sign of Christ in the sky. And that's when uh, he decided to uh, stop the persecution of Christians. and. Um, the uh, details of it was that the sign of Christ was actually the first two Greek letters of the name Christ. Mm. So Christus is the Greek pronunciation of Christ. And the letter that makes the K sound is written as a big X. Mm -hmm. And that X is named Chi. And then the er sound for Christ, right? The er sound is written in Greek as a big P mm -hmm. and the, it's called Rho. Yep. And so the first two letters is called Chi Rho. And, uh, and so Constantine sees this X and a P uh, and he decides to put it on all of his shields and symbols. Um, 
and he supposedly heard a phrase in Greek and tautu nika, um, uh, but in Latin it's translated in hoc signo vinces, which means in this sign, this signo, this sign, you'll be invincible. Vinces mean victory. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, he puts it on all of his shields and you'll see the initials I H S V accompany that. And then the next day is the battle of the Milvian bridge. Now, if Maxentius would have stayed in Rome, he probably would have waited it out and won, but Maxentius decides to come out and fight him hmm. and he's killed at the battle. And so now Constantine is the Roman emperor and, and, um, he stops the persecution of Christians. He puts the sign of Christ on all of his shields and symbols and coins. And so from Constantine all the way through the rest of this Byzantine era, uh, you see this uh, Kai robe on all of the Christian Roman uh, signs. And then you'll often see the eight IHSV in hoc signo vinces. Mm -hmm. And, um, now, over the years, the Kai Road just got shortened to the Kai, and it was called the Christ's Cross or Criss Cross. And that's where you get the Xmas. So instead of X hyphen M-A-S being crossing out Christ, no, it's the Greek letter Kai, which stood for Christ. Wow. And then it came down as a part of a written oath. So that's not a recent thing, Xmas. It's an ancient thing, centuries old. Correct. Wow. And and it was also used as a written oath. So if you're in a court and you're going to tell the truth, you'll put your hand on a Bible and say, I swear to tell the truth, so help me God. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're signing a document and swearing to tell the truth on the document, you would sign at the Christ's cross, right? Wow. And so it was this swearing that what is in the document is true. You're going to be faithful to it. And I'm swearing before Christ. Hmm. And that came down to, you know, sign at the X or put your X here. And then they would often kiss it to show sincerity. And so that's come down to us as the X's and the O's on the bottom of a Valentine. Hmm. The X that you're pledging your faithfulness in front of Christ to this other person. And then you're the O to represent a kiss to show sincerity. And it's also come down to us as cross my heart, swear to tell the truth. Right. Hmm. And, um, and so that's called the Kai or the Makes Christ. Makes sense cross. now. And, um, so Constantine issues the Edict of Milan in 313 AD, officially ending the persecution of Christians. That's good news for those people in jail waiting death. Right. And so one of those in jail was Nicholas. And so mm -hmm. now he's let out of the Roman prison. And he uh, preaches, now that it's okay to be a Christian, he pe preaches publicly against pagan practices. Such Which as was the official practices. Roman religion, right? Paganism. Right. Uh, and so... Uh, the Romans had human sacrifice, infant exposure, and divination. And, you know, they found these, um, uh, you know, pagan temples, and they would, uh, mm -hmm. you know, have the temple prostitutes, but then they'd have a, a room in the bottom of it with, like, um, all these carcass, you know, they, the skeletons of little babies. So these, oh, no. You know, uh, that they, the women that would bear the kids and throw them in there. Um, so it's infant exposure. Rome yeah. started... Uh, the Roman tradition was that the um, the mother would bear the child and put the child at the father's feet. If the father picked up the child, looked at it, liked it, thought they could afford it, they got to, the mother got to keep the child. If the dad said, ah, it doesn't look healthy or I don't think we can afford it, the mother would have to place the babies outside and expose them to the elements, often putting them in a basket and they'd, you know, uh, put them up in the woods and then the mother would like give her heartfelt goodbyes to the little baby and then, you know, leave little things in the basket, but then leave, you know, when that turned in, into the tradition of leaving the basket at the doorstep of an elderly couple or maybe a couple that doesn't have a kid. Mm. And so we've heard stories, you know, Oh, there's a knock on the door and they look down, there's a baby in a basket. Well, that was the Roman tradition. Mm. Um, they would call it exposure. Uh, now the early Christians, would preach against this practice um, and uh, the same, with the same fervency as Christians today preaching against abortion. Of course. And, um, but the Roman Empire started with Romulus and Remus, right? Mm -hmm. And their dad didn't want them. And so he put them outside to be exposed 
to the elements and die. Uh, but then supposedly a wolf came and nursed Romulus and Remus. And so in this picture, you see the wolf in the background and it's a, obviously a female wolf. Yep. And so now that it's uh, legal to be a Christian and uh, Nicholas is preaching against paganism, preaching against exposure of unwanted infants. Um, he preaches against, um, uh, you know, the idol worship. Um, the, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was, was the temple to Diana at Ephesus, uh, 127 huge pillars and temple prostitutes. It was mm. the Las Vegas of the Mediterranean. Wow. Oh, I feel like I'm going to take a pilgrimage to Ephesus. So it's like, oh yeah, real religious. Yeah. You're just going to have a, uh, anyway. And, what happens so, in Ephesus stays in Ephesus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so it was the more heights of more immorality. Yeah. And uh, the apostle Paul preached at Ephesus. Remember that? Yes. And, um, and the, you know, they had a revival and were burning their, it's Acts chapter 19. Mm. And so, um, there was a local temple, Diana, at Myra, and wow. after Nicholas's preaching, the people Look at that toward statue. The yeah, it's a it's a little multi-breasted little icon. Remember? Yeah, the, fertility. Uh, was, yeah, um, fertility goddess. And mm. so when Paul was preaching at Ephesus, um, they all gathered together in the amphitheater. And they began to yell for two hours, great is Diana, the goddess of the Ephesians. Her image fell from heaven. And it's like, what was the image? Well, it was this little pagan deity. And mm. then these you know, people in Ephesus would make these little idols. And this girl was following the apostle Paul around, you know, mo- sort of mocking him. Well, these people are servants of the most high God. And then Paul cast the devil out of her. And, and the, you know, the, the idol worshipers are like, look, we make all of our money making little idols of Diana. And now nobody's going to want to buy these little idols of Diana. Well, it was this, you know, little fertility thing. Um, Nevertheless, the people tear the local temple to Diana down. And then a few years later, another church leader named John Chrysostom, and Chrysostom means golden mouth because he was a very powerful preacher. Wow. Um, he, He preached against the temple to Diana at Ephesus, and the people tore the temple to Diana down. Dang. And all that's left is they piece together one pillar of it, um, you know, but at least it marks the spot of where the, the old temple used to hmm. be. And for centuries after that, um, you had uh, people in Greece, uh, the locals would gather the stones from the temple to Diana and drag them away to use in rebuilding churches and other different buildings in the area. Hmm. Um, now, during this time, uh, Nicholas preached against paganism. What was one of the pagan things? The Olympics. They ran them naked. The word gym, G-Y-M, is the Greek word for naked. And so a gymnasium was where a bunch of naked men ran around. Oh, gross. And uh, I actually went to school uh, in um, uh, Europe and in Rome and Greece in college. And so we went to uh, all these different, you know, places. And, um, uh, but yeah, uh, the, the Greeks idolized uh the the you know the human body it was very humanist um and i won't get into it all but uh a lot of immoral it's probably stuff. a kindness yeah you know <laughs> uh they had the lgbt agenda even way back then um really but um uh yeah you know you, you read the iliad and the odyssey homer and so forth and achilles had a little a guy that's always mentioned with him. And yeah, that was his little boy lover, you know? And so they would do that pedophilia and um, pedestry. Yeah. And so when Nicholas becomes, he can preach publicly, he preaches against the sexual immorality of the Greek and, and the Roman culture. Good. So if he were alive today, Nicholas would be preaching against the LGBT and then the transgender. And he'd be, he'd be standing up for biblical morality. Wow. He's a, he's a full on Christian activist. Yes, yes. And um, I mean, here he is, you know, tearing down pagan temples, preaching against uh, uh, abortion, their version of it, you know, exposure. And then there's the Arian heresy. Uh, I love this story. This is fantastic. This is such a great way to think of Santa Claus. I love it. And so the first three centuries of Christianity, Christians are thrown to the lions and they really don't live long enough to argue over doctrine. (laughs) <laughs> and um, I mentioned I went to school in Rome and we toured the catacombs and, you know, you're, you're going outside of a little area of Rome and 
you know, the, the tour guide, you're walking down this sort of little one lane road and you come up to like a little hill and a, you know, and it looks like a drainage ditch almost, but it has a little iron gate and the tour guide, you know, reaches down and unlocks the little gate. Then everybody has to hunch over and like scoot back in this little narrow passageway for like 30 yards. And you finally open up to a, you know, probably like 30 by 30 room carved right out of the rock with first century graffiti and, you know, candle marks on the ceiling and little niches where they put the bones of the different saints, you know, the, the Jewish practice. And then the Christians picked it up was you buried somebody. Um, and then a year or two later, you open up their grave, take out their bones, wrap them really nice in cloth and put them in a vase. And, um, and so they would have these little niches where they'd have the vases of, you know, these are old saints. And mm -hmm. anyway, so, um, uh, so the first three centuries of Christianity, it was this uh, situation where the Christian experience was very personal, very intense. Um, they didn't, you know, it was private because you couldn't have big crowds in these little cramped spaces. Um, and so when Constantine legalizes Christianity, now you can come out of the cave and now you can be a Christian publicly. Mm. And, um, and that's when you had the first heresy and this, one bishop named Arius said Jesus was a little less than God and that he was a created being. Mm. And Arius writes a catchy song. And the Visigoths, who were one of the tribes that overran the Roman Empire, they converted in mass to Arianism. Hmm. And it began to split the Christian church. And Constantine's attitude was, look, you guys, I made you legal. And now you're bickering amongst yourself and your church split is splitting my empire. And so you need, you need to settle this thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's having political fallout. And so Constantine orders and pays for all the bishops of, of from all the entire Christian world to come to Nicaea and settle it. Mm -hmm. It's the first time that all the church leaders of the entire world get together in one place and there's about 1,500 people, and there's like 300 bishops, you know, but with all their staff and everything. And at the Council of Nicaea, they uh, reaffirm the doctrine of the Trinity, and they reject Arius. And in the picture there, you see all the bishops around, and then you got Arius in the little hole <laughs> down at the bottom. I see. And um, uh, and there's another painting of it. The year is 325 <laughs> A.D., uh, mm -hmm. They reaffirm uh, the doctrine in the Nicene Creed, uh, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and so forth. And uh, then again, you see there's all the bishops and there's Arius down in the hole. And uh, But the, the story is that Nicholas was so upset at Arius for starting this first heresy to split the, the Christian church that Nicholas slapped Arius across the face on the floor of the conference. And so uh, the jolly old St. Nick had a little temper. You better watch out if he's coming to town, right? And exactly. it was uh, funny. I was, you know, on the internet looking for, you know, pictures. And um, uh, I saw this one. It says, uh, it's a picture of Nicholas. It says, I came to give presents to kids and to punch heretics. I just ran out of presents. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, again, but he he's like the founding father of the Greek Orthodox Church. And so he slapped Arius, the bishop because he was uh, teaching this heresy. Right, right. So, uh, so Nicholas actually got in trouble for it. So you can see in the background, it's got the letters N, K, O, you know, so it's the Greek letters that stood for Nicholas. And right. so uh, they were going to like censor uh, Nicholas and sort of, you know, uh, disrobe you know, him. Of, yeah. A little of that. But then, that night, uh, another bishop had a dream of the Lord telling him, don't touch Nicholas. He's my, you know, my man. And so they don't uh, just defrock him or whatever. That's the one. Disrobe. Okay. <laughs> defrock. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's all we have time for in this episode of Pello Talk. But there is so much more to cover with Christian historian William Federer around Santa Claus and the history of Christmas. So look out for the next episode of Pello Talk coming very soon uh, with William Federer. Bill, thank you so much. I've, um, I've really enjoyed uh, reading the ebook. I, I got the ebook version of it, and um, it's uh, great plowing through it. It's a great little uh, a reference 
as as well um, for some of these things. It's great to even have Santa Claus redeemed a little bit from being this uh, Coca Cola commercial um, and and central to the commercialization of Christmas altogether. Redeemed back to hey, this guy was a committed Jesus worshiping believer, and um, and and this is the whole purpose of Christmas. He he was all about those things that you mentioned, all the things that the kingdom of God is all about. Thank you so much. It's been an honor being on with you and. Uh, uh, Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night <laughs> and look forward to the next time. Very good. Thank you very much. That's uh, William Federer and you can uh, get all of his details, find out much more, order the book. Um, there really is a Santa Claus for yourself and it might make a great Christmas present for somebody and also get a whole lot more information from AmericanMinute.com. Just a reminder that the Church and State Summit is on in February. And we've got uh, Dr. Michael Brown coming over all the way from America, as well as uh, many other high caliber speakers uh, from Australia, just to share more information about our Christian heritage, our Christian legacy, and what the Church of Jesus Christ has to offer, um, like Santa Claus, as activists for justice and righteousness and peace and good morals in a nation. This is a blessing to our 25 million neighbours. And uh, this is not something that we have any right to withhold from them. And so the Church and State Summit is all about equipping, empowering, encouraging, and inspiring Christians to be like Bishop Nicholas of Myra, uh, somebody who's actively involved in in the welfare of his nation and and his neighbours. So you can get details for that. Register for the Church and State Summit and get more information um, at churchandstate.com.au. This year, for the first time, the summit is going to four cities. The full two-day summit will be in Brisbane. But uh, before that, we're going to spend an afternoon and an evening in Auckland and Melbourne and Sydney. And uh, that's going to be a whole lot of fun. So if you can't make it to Brisbane, I hope you can make it to one of those other stops. And of course, um, if you can't make it at all, or if you're there and you want to relive the whole thing, you're also going to be able to get the whole lot on video. Um, but that's it for Pello Talk. Don't forget to head to my website, davepello.com. Subscribe to newsletters there. And you can also follow me on all the social media channels at Dave Pello. And uh, until the next time we uh, see you, I'll see you in the comments section.